All right. Good afternoon, everybody. I think we've got most everybody who RSVP'd, so we'll go ahead and get started. Welcome, and thank you for joining us for this edition of Cloud Bytes, a Sage Intact educational series hosted by Dean Dorton. Today, we're going to be taking a look at the very first Sage Intact release of 2024, presented by our Software Services Director, Philip Mincy. If you have any questions throughout the webinar, please use the Q&A icon to ask. We'll be monitoring those questions throughout the session, and we'll make sure to share them with Philip during the Q&A period at the end. If we don't address your question today during the session, contact information will be included at the end of the session and in the follow-up email. This webinar is being recorded, so you'll receive a link to the recording and slides in that follow-up email as well. Again, thank you for joining us today, and please don't hesitate to ask questions. I know there's a lot to cover in this release, so I'll go ahead and turn it over to Philip. All right, Nikki, well, I appreciate that very much. Um, you're absolutely right. There is a lot to cover in this release. Uh, so I'm going to go ahead and jump right in. I've got a lot of uh, PowerPoint slides uh, to get through. It looks like 82 of them. Um, some of them will be faster than others, and I will try to skip any uh, that we feel pertinent because uh, uh, like to show you some things in the software if if we have that opportunity. So uh, one of the first things that I want to make you aware of that's part of this release is a new fixed assets management module. So with the release of R1, um, should have taken that word upcoming out of there. Sorry about that. But with the release of R1, uh, there is a new fixed assets module. It is an additional cost uh, as far as we know at this point. So it's not something that's going to be rolled out to everyone. And it will be geared at an organization who, who might have up to 5,000 assets, who might have um, you know, a couple of books that they want to track, tax, uh, corporate depreciation, things like that. More is going to be coming on this. It's it's out technically, but it's it's not something that we're going to push or try to sell just yet. Uh, we will know more after the Transform event, which if you haven't heard, uh, shame on us for not making it more apparent to you. Um, it is next week. If you haven't registered already, I'm not sure if there's still the ability to do that or not, to be honest with you, but look out for information from our team if you aren't able to make it to Las Vegas for it. Um, we do have a team member, Tabitha Smaltz, who is doing uh, or as a is a part of three presentations at Transform. You can see them listed there. If you are going to Transform, I think that first one uh, is especially good uh, that Tabitha is going to be doing. So if you can jump in that one, uh, and she's got a couple others there too that will be equally insightful. So if you have a chance please do uh, stop by and see her. If not, look out for the updates from us after everyone gets back from Transform and has a chance to put all their thoughts together. All right, so there are there is uh, a symbol uh, on each of these enhancements as we go forward that's going to tell you how this is uh, to be utilized or can be utilized within your organization. Um, and those symbols are listed here, and I'll try to point them out as we go through it. But we did want to include this in the presentation so that when you get your copy, you have this for reference. These are the things we're going to talk about today. Some of the notable enhancements over here. And, and, and let's really read this as most widespread enhancements. These are going to affect the most people that might be taking a look at this webinar. These are some of the more targeted uh, enhancements. So your inventory, your consolidations, um, everybody probably is using cash management and AP and reporting and those types of things. Um, so we'll, we'll divide these up into this criteria. So let's jump into the notable enhancements. So again, this is the first release of 2024. Uh, came out just this past weekend. Um, as you know, there's four releases a year on the Intact application. So there's one in May, August, and November. 
yet to come. So this is R1 of 2024. So when we talk about company and administration, we've got a few things to make you aware of. Uh, API usage dashboards, user interface labels, list enhancements, new email address for user accounts, and self-service auto recovery. Now this first one, API usage dashboard now in consoles. This is something that probably only would affect a very small portion of our audience. In the last release, everyone got the ability to see their API usage dashboard in their instance. So if you're in your instance and you want to take a look at it, you can go to, to, to the usage metrics area, API usage, and you can see the calls you're making and success rates, failure rates, all that kind of stuff inside of the user metrics area. This has been expanded for those companies that are on a distributed console, which if you're not, you probably don't know what that means, but if you are, then you do know what that means. Uh, but this essentially gives uh, organizations that have that in place a chance to look at their API usage across all of their instances uh, and entities of intact. Uh, list enhancements for turning on the beta. So if you haven't tried these things yet, um, I've experimented with them some. I think the, the 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 most pleasant aspect of this is I quit clicking on the wrong link. Uh, if I'm looking at a vendor and I don't remember to click edit, I click the vendor name and it pops me into the vendor agings and stuff like that within the system. This helps with that because it basically can can help prevent that kind of, of activity. Plus, you do have, as you can see here, more filtering capabilities within the system. There's a lot more that you get in these beta list views now than in the existing standard list views. You turn them on and turn them off by uh, clicking the link on the window itself. Okay, so take a look at those, try those out. I think they're great. Um, I think it makes the navigation within those types of records uh, a lot easier, uh, to be quite frank. So user interface changes, um, they updated UI labels uh, across the system so that we have more consistency with and clarity with the titles that are used. And that's really just trying to clean things up inside the system. Now, a new email address for user counts. So a new address has been added onto the Sage Intact screen, as you can see here, account email address. Um, this is new on the screen. And basically it allows you to input that email address and manage that email address from this screen rather than having to dive two to three places into the system in order to maintain that email address. Uh, it it kind of helps ensure a, a greater level of privacy uh, for the users. And you do have an ability here, like I said, to be more consistent with where you are managing your information. So that's neat. Look out for that. Um, when this is enabled in your instance, it will default to the email address from the contact record that is associated to the user ID. So you shouldn't have had to do anything in here to input email addresses. It will take the data that you already have in the system. It just exposes it on this screen for you so that, again, you're not diving multiple levels deep in the software. Uh, so a couple things, uh, email addresses can be changed by admins under user preferences, or the user can change their account email address under my preferences. So again, this is uh, allowing for more, more ease of use of the system for keeping up with email addresses and things of that nature, and does help facilitate the self-service account recovery process with recovering an end user's password. Um, you know, the, the, the current UI contains just that one email address uh, on the contact record, um, and a lot of people have access to that contact record. They can easily change it, uh, change your email address. Uh, that means when you go to reset your password, you may not get an email because someone has accidentally perhaps changed that email address. 
now you've got an ability inside the system to have more control over those uh, email addresses and have that given to uh, the right person. So here's just an example of a locked out notice, right? This is the email. You guys may have seen this before. You may not, but uh, this is a, a lockout notice. You've exceeded the maximum number of attempts to log into the system, uh, and it kind of gives you some guidance as to how to recover your account, uh, reset your password, etc. A lot of programs have that these days. Quite frankly, Intact is trying to, you know, again, clarify, clean up the interface and make it so that end users can manage their own accounts and their own processes. Okay. And of course, just as a reminder, you can come in here and set under updates, um, uh, I'm sorry, under company, security, and then look in the passwords area. And you do have an ability in here to set the maximum number of attempts at logging in, things of that nature before a an individual is, is logged out. Okay. So some list enhancements. Definitely encourage you to take uh, take a look at those and, and see uh, those list enhancements. And if we get some opportunity, um, I'm going to take a look at those today and, and show those to you just so that you can see them. Um, and then that account email address on the user's record uh, has been moved out to that front screen so that it's easier to maintain. From an accounts payable standpoint, a couple of things. Uh, restrict vendor contacts, uh, delete advanced filters, restrict user reversing portion of a bill, and then export AP automation subscription usage information. So if we take a look at those, you can restrict your contacts that appear in the pay to and return to drop down list when entering bills to just those contacts related to the selected vendor. That is an overall section in the uh, configuration of the accounts payable module, but you do have that ability now so that you're not picking from a list perhaps of, of hundreds, maybe thousands of different contacts. You're only picking from the individuals related to that vendor. To make the data entry experience uh, quite a bit easier. So you can see here uh, showing all contacts in this list. You've got a number of people listed and you can see here restrict to vendor contacts. You have far less people listed in this list than you do over here. Notice how small the scroller is versus how large the scroller is. So our list over here is much smaller. It's just purely cleaning up that list. Right. Um, configuration considerations before you enable this feature, make sure that any open bills have the correct selected contact. Um, and a configuration warning indicates that if you edit a bill and the contact showing is not the list of contacts for the vendor, you'll receive an error when saving the bill. So the thing to keep in mind here is that if you do make this change inside the system and flip that switch in the payables configuration setup screen, you will have to do all bills going forward that you want to save. That means new ones and existing ones that you might want to edit or make a change to. Say they were draft and you want to go back in and finish it up and post it, or you need to make a correction and repost it, anything like that. Any bill that you pull up from that point forward will be affected by this change you make. But again, that is an excellent opportunity if it applies to your organization to trim down that list of people and hopefully prevent errors that might occur from selecting the wrong John Doe when you go in and pick a uh, pay to person. Deleting shared advanced filters. I have uh, I have uh, heard pr from customers, clients about this in the past. If a if a person is is at the organization and they have a number of filters that they've built, uh, let's say you know even 15, 20, whatever it is about certain things, then when that person leaves and their user is inactivated or, or no longer able to log into the system, it's very difficult, uh, if not impossible, to get rid of those shared advanced filters in the system. 
So Indact Now has given you an ability to come into here and clean up those shared advanced filters. So in the pay bills area, for example, filter by, add a filter set, you're going into the advanced filters and you're checking this box to share it with others. If the person that creates that leaves, it's very difficult to delete those shared filters. Here, um, you can now come in here and edit the filters and you can delete the filters. So again, it's it's giving you an ability to clean up the system, to, uh, to continue to configure the system and have it be as appropriate for your environment as it can be going forward. The next thing is restricted users reversing portions of a bill. So if you are using user entity restrictions, for example, in the system, and you have an AP bill that is in the system and it's been keyed into the system and you later add someone into the environment and you restrict them to the entities that they can work in, they will no longer be able to reverse any bills in the system that are coded to locations or departments that they do not have security access to. Previously it was kind of a loophole. They still would be able to reverse those AP bill transactions, uh, even if they didn't have access to one of the departments, for example, on the AP bill and that was done after the bill was entered or what have you. However, you got to that situation. Previously, there was a bit of a loophole uh, in the system that would allow uh, an individual to go in and reverse an AP bill if they did not have access, even if they did not have access to some of the dimensional codings in the bill. Um, prior to the release, the restricted user would still be able to reverse that bill, even if line items belong to other locations or departments. With the current release, they will be uh, they will receive an error message like this, indicating that there are portions of this bill they do not have security access rights to, and therefore they cannot reverse this bill. Have someone else do it. One of the smallest, uh, I think, little features in here that's pretty powerful is the bill approval notification. So users who submit bills for approval now receive an email notification when the bill is approved or declined. Immediate communication is sent to those uh, submitters for approvals slash declines. So if you turn on email notifications in the AP bill configuration, and then in your preferences, you check this box here for bills, you will be notified for anything that you submit when action is taken on that document. Uh, let's say, for example, you uploaded a bill into AP Automation, system creates the draft, you review the draft and submit the bill for approval. Prior to this change, you didn't receive any notification if the bill was approved or declined. Now you can configure your own settings to ensure that you do get those notifications. So that's a nice, that's a little thing in, in some minds, but that is a really nice thing to have inside the system now to close that loop on communication around those transactions. Um, you can also now take a look at and export your AP automation subscription usage from your subscription usage page. So if you are using the AP automation tool inside of Intact, you do have the ability to see that history, but you can now also export that history out to Excel, CSV, or something like that. You can, you can take that data then into some other application for analysis or anything that you might want to do. Okay. Accounts receivable. Um, these two are going to sound very similar. Uh, I, in, in doing demonstrations of Intact, I often kind of joke that accounts payable is accounts receivable in reverse or vice versa. These particular additions or enhancements to the system uh, ring true to that. So you can also now restrict customer contacts. Uh, limit the list of selectable contacts for AR transactions to those associated with a customer record. 
This simplifies the list of contacts available when entering a transaction and reduces the chance for errors. So quite simply put here, you can set it so that in your AR module in Intact, if you're entering in an invoice uh, into the system, you can only pick contacts from the selected customer or payer. And you can see that option right there on the screen. Um, these are the three different choices on that screen that you can take advantage of in here. Basically, the top one is, is kind of how it's always been. The second one was uh, uh, released a little while back. The third one is the one that is coming out with this, just came out with this particular uh, release. You will get an error if you try to pick someone who is not in there. So in this case, the bill to contact Phoebe Jacobs is not associated with the customer. Uh, to use this, assign this contact to the customer and try again. Otherwise, select a different customer contact. So it's pretty matter of fact with you. Wrong. Uh, let's do something to change that or pick somebody else. Same kind of things here. It is effective period from that date forward. So if you are, if you do have some drafts, if you do have bills and you need to change something on them and reposting, re, or I should say invoices, and you, you need to repost them for some reason, they will be caught in this configuration and you will have to make sure that the correct contacts are on the invoice. Same thing here for restricted users reversing portions of an invoice. So again, just like we talked about in AP bills, this is AR invoices and we're doing the same thing. If the user that is attempting to reverse an invoice does not have permissions to all departments and or locations that are stipulated on that AR invoice, they will not be able to complete that reversal and they will have to find someone who can, who has unrestricted access or at least access to those objects, those dimensional values that are involved in this transaction. So uh, cash management. So, so far, a lot of what we've heard in this release has been about keeping your data clean, uh, keeping your system clean, uh, you know, cleaning up old filters, making sure that your contacts that are selected are proper, making sure that email addresses are correct, all those types of things. It's mainly been about trying to keep the system clean. Now in cash management, um, we've got uh, the ability now to match reconciliation transactions with match sequences. Um, there's now a new report object that allows the reporting of reconciliation matches and you can efficiently review uh, those matches. So in the last release, they introduced the match sequences to bring visibility to your bank and credit card matches. If you didn't uh, see that, if you haven't used it yet, Dawn Parker did a fantastic uh, 2023 R4 presentation. We'd be happy to send that out to you. You can probably find it on our YouTube channel or something of that nature. Um, but this gives you an ability to create reports around that information so that your matching, your sequencing process inside of bank reconciliation can be much more straightforward, much more thorough. Uh, you can generate the custom report to see the stage intact transactions for this re report to appear. Matching sequencing must, sequencing must be enabled in your instance. And again, that would be something discussed in the 2023 R4 release. But if that's enabled, you then can come in to the custom report wizard and create a reconciliation match report. And that would be something that you could pull the fields on that you want to see, save that as a custom report in the system, and then run it at any point, any time that you would need it. Here's a sample report showing the transactions as they've been matched, and then details to, as it says here, tell that story of the transaction. So the groupings here, the details behind it here, and you're able to see the matchings that took place. Now, this next one is one that could potentially be beneficial for, for a lot of organizations if you're more, if you're working in multiple time zones. Let's say 
you're an international organization, you've got offices overseas, you've got maybe even offices just in different parts of the US, you now have an ability to set a time zone for your bank within the banking cloud. That's at, at, at first, honestly, when I saw this, I wasn't really sure where they were going with this, but basically it allows you to configure the system so that your dates are proper inside the system. Obviously, if you're overseas, you could be talking about different days based on which time zone you're looking at. If you have operations in Australia, obviously, as well as in the, the let's say the West Coast of the US, then there are going to be great potentials for technically speaking different days on these transactions this will allow you to set the time zone and it will pull the date and time information based on that time zone as opposed to based on your organizational or your instance time zone that you've created uh, the the thing to keep in mind here it could result in uh, date of the transactions coming from the banking cloud to be incorrect if it is not set properly. The purpose of the feature is to adjust the dating so that the time zone assigned to the bank account so that it overrides everything else. Right. Again, the, the most obvious uh, conversation about this would be if you had operations in Australia, but certainly there are times in which the time zone could make a difference, uh, even if it is not that far from, even if the offices are not separated by that much. Okay. From an import standpoint, so if you all do any imports into the Sage NTAC system, uh, there's a couple of things here. Downloading import files uh, templates is more e is easier now uh, than it was before in most all places. Enhancements to bank file payments and chart of accounts import file, the closed to change. So you can download your import templates. Hopefully all of you know that Sage NTAC does come with import templates so that if you need to import a general journal file, you can download a template for that general ledger journal and use that template to populate the data in and make sure that it's in the right formats. It has hints, it has information about those imports. It's all right there in front of you. And Intact has gone through in the system and made sure that it had as many touch points as possible. And I think there's really only one uh, left that's not, uh, and that's the chart of accounts import. But at as many touch points as possible, certainly in the transactional areas, you have an ability to get that template and not have to go into the mass import screen inside the system, right? Company information screen, uh, data import screen, whatever uh, your organization calls it. You don't have to go into that screen. All of the different record areas have the ability to download those templates now with the one exception, if I'm not mistaken. So here are the areas that have been added to make sure that these things are in the appropriate places. Um, and simply the way that it works is if you click to import budgets, you will see a choice here to download the template. Again, you don't have to go to the import data screen. You don't have to ask someone to go to the import data screen for you, grab a template and send it to you because you don't have permissions to that window. You can come here to the import window, download the template, and then use that for populating for your transactions. It's always a good idea to keep a copy of the downloads and maybe the last upload you did, but in case something should happen, it has been made easier now for everyone to reach these templates. So where will we see, uh, where we see not, or I'm sorry, where will we not see the updates? Uh, GL accounts can only be imported from company import data screen. Uh, that's that's the only place to import GL accounts. So therefore, you won't be able to get the template for importing GL accounts unless you go into the import data screen. Everything else that you can import in places other than the the import data screen, 
you will have the ability now to get those templates as well. Enhancements to the bank file payments, uh, import and update employees in bulk through CSV import. So you can now enable employees for bank file payments, add bank details for employee expense re reimbursements and update employee bank details in mass using the new CSV import template. So if, if that's something that you need to do uh, within your organization, it is now uh, right at your fingertips to be able to use those CSV imports to get to that data and import it. Now, speaking of the chart of accounts import file, there is a very important change uh, that's been made. Most of you may not get into chart of accounts imports in your system. Companies that are in, uh, let's say, merger and acquisitions uh, or, or, or space or anything like that, where they are acquiring organizations, it's possible you might uh, import a chart of accounts, but my guess is probably a lot of you aren't going to be importing tons of accounts uh, going forward if you've been on the system for quite some time. In any case, uh, in the general ledger chart of accounts import and import template, uh, you'll no longer be able to use the letter R, which represents closed to in the closable column. Uh, you'll need to use N, which represents non-closing instead for the retained earnings or net asset account in the closable column. Um, you then would continue to reference the account number for the retained earnings account in that column for the close too. So this is really coming into the import templates inside the system, making a change that makes it consistent with all the other import methodologies and setups within this particular import file. You no longer uh, designate an R, you simply continue to designate ends for non-closing and you would stipulate the appropriate closed to account uh, over there if necessary. And again, a lot of you probably won't be able, won't be doing that that much unless you're mergers and acquisitions, but that's another a uh, step towards consistency and clarity in how processes are handled inside Sage Intact. So that's that's a lot of what this release is about uh, for, for what we're going to talk about for the most part anyway, is, is about cleaning up some of the processes and giving more clarity to how processes are handled and done inside the system and more consistency to it as well. Now, that being said, one of the things that I personally think is a very cool new feature that's been added, and we'll have to see how this kind of plays out and all that kind of stuff, Is I know that, uh, but their intent here, I think, is very, very nice. Versioning history for financial reports. <laughs> you know, uh, with a lot of the cloud sharing apps, you can have versioning history for your Word documents, your Excel files, that kind of thing. You, you, you really royally hose an Excel sheet. You've got the ability potentially then to go back to the, a previous version of that Excel sheet. That's what you're going to have in Intact, uh, which I think is a great thing. And then there have been some improvements made to the report schedules as well. So version history for financial reports. If you are in a financial report and you have made a change and saved it, you will see a version history under the more actions button. So right here, I'm in the financial report writer, more actions, and I will see a version history button here. I will be able to use that to go into the system and pick a version of the report to restore. Now, the, the question that, that I've heard asked about this and the answer that I've heard given, can I do a restore as? The answer to that is no, not right now. You will be restoring over top of the report that you are on, but you can quite simply, before you restore, duplicate a report 
give it another name, and then restore the report that you want to restore. So that in a sense, you can keep both of those versions of a report. So to me, this is very nice. Um, I'm sure they're not done with this functionality, and they'll likely add some additional functionality in here at some point in the future, maybe even the restore as type functionality, which I think would be great. But this is fantastic. If you have multiple people working in your GL department and they are making occasional or frequent changes to your financial statements, this is great because you can always go back if someone makes a change that isn't in line with policy or desire or is just incorrect for, for whatever reason, right? Um, when viewing, uh, let's see, only up to the last 100 versions saved will be captured. So that is kind of important to know if you're in there and you're making a change and you're saving it, and you're making a change and you're saving it, and you're making a change and you're saving it. Um, you are uh, starting that clock, starting that ticker in the report. And when you get 100, it's going to simply overwrite 101 is simply going to overwrite the oldest, et cetera, right? So you're going through, or or the oldest are going to drop off, I should say. So your, your number 100, when you save 101, number 100 will drop off, right? So it only saves up to 100. Versioning limitations, uh, changes to the format of the report, such as account groups or dimension structures. Versioning does not go back and indicate what was changed. The purpose of versioning is to record the report setting changes and to let you make changes. And if you think about it, these things are really not done in the report creation process itself. Account groups, Although involved in reports, absolutely, dimension structures, absolutely, part of the reports, part of the way that reports are laid out and things like that. Don't argue with that at all. But they have their own windows. So those processes, even though you can make them within some of the different areas of financial report writing, those changes aren't captured by it because in a sense, they're you're you're viewing a window into those areas to be able to make those changes you're not actually doing it on the financial report itself right so those changes at this point in time right now there will be no indication of what was changed in here um, we'll provide you with the versioning but it would be something along those lines that you would have to go back and figure out what changed okay so an improved process for setting up report schedules. Um, this one is, I, I have run into this a couple of times in the past myself. You've got a report schedule set up within the system. You go in and you make some changes to that report schedule. And the next thing you know, it's gone back in time and it's generated the report, you know, a hundred times for you because this report schedule is is two years old or something like that. And it's just gone all the way back to the beginning and flooded them back all to your mailbox again. So in, in the current release now, there's a limit on that. It's not going to produce more than 31 reports for any past dates. Their wording here is probably the best way to explain this. Suppose you create a schedule to run a report daily for a year starting 1-1-2023. At the end of the year, 1231, you review and decide to continue this schedule indefinitely. You edit the schedule, remove the end date, but you inadvertently, you forget, to change the start date. Running this schedule would create the report for every day from the start date to today, which would in a sense generate 365 reports. <laughs> that is prior to this release. With this release, it would still produce 31 reports, but that's one less than a tenth of, or a twelfth of the reports that you would have gotten prior to this release. Now, ultimately in here on this, 
you know, one of the things that you would want to do is right here, it says you inadvertently do not change the start date. Don't forget to change the start date. Review it carefully. If you're on 12-31-2023, bump that start date to 1-1-2024, and you won't get any reports until 1-1-24, and you'll get the report for that day, right? So there, there are ways around this in the first place to where you don't even get the 31 reports. This is a safeguard built into the system so that if you do miss making that change, you will not get bombarded. Um, here, uh, let's let's skip that one actually. Um, so this with uh, financial report writer report schedules, it will not go too far back into the past, 31 occurrences. Um, as we had said before, so if you're in here with the start date and you forget to make that change, it does give you uh, a bit of fail safe for that. Okay. So let me scroll forward here. I think we've got the point on that one. Um, inventory utilities. I'm just going to go through these here real quick because I do want to show you a couple of things in the software. If you are running the inventory module, you now have security permissions around those inventory utilities. It's easier to get to the utilities. It's, it's easier to manage those utilities and to prevent folks from getting to those utilities who should not. Basically, they are grouped into uh, an area and you have control over that area as to who can actually get into those inventory utilities. So that's a very good thing for those running the inventory module. Helps keep that clean and safe. Uh, new permissions on the employee bank details and time and expenses. So if you are in your time and expense permissions and you are uh, using this portion of the program, you can now unmask or mask bank details. So you have an ability in here by default, they're going to be masked for security reasons, but you could grant someone permission to see the bank details um, to set uh, this up, Sage Cloud Services, enable bank file payment, come over here, set up your bank details, set up your bank payment uh, file details. And then if you're looking at the employee, you can see unmasked, or perhaps you just see the last four digits of the account in which case you would have the masked information, of course. Okay. A um, few more things. So in consolidations, uh, if you're running consolidations, there is a lot in the uh, advanced ownership area within the system now. So this is a very nice uh, component of the intact solution. So if you are looking for things like partial ownerships and those types of things, or uh, just different ownerships and criteria uh, around your consolidations that might be something for you uh, to take a look at. And what I think are some of the more interesting ads uh, in this solution or, or features, enhancements, uh, changes, et cetera, in this solution are these industry solutions. Um, I'm actually a little puzzled. Uh, we We take we take the materials that Sage gives us uh, for these webinars like this, and we repurpose it um, perfectly allowable and all that thing and all that sort of stuff. But I'm not quite sure why these three got labeled as industry solutions. Um, these three, at, at least the top two, are going to be something that I think uh, could be real game changers in the aspect of connected organizations for those companies that use Sage Intact. So I would very much encourage you to keep an eye out for information on these. If you're going to transform, I'm sure there's going to be information on them. If you're not, <clears throat> keep an eye out for our post-transform presentations. But the Sage Intact data flow, seamlessly integrate your other applications with Sage Intact. If you guys are familiar, if you've heard of tools like Zapier or Zapier, um, and there's a number of those out there that can do that type of thing, this is what that is going to be. So you're gonna be able to pull in connectors from other software solutions and, and 
merge and meld data with your Sage Intact tool using these data flows. One of the examples could be if you have an operations system, if you have a donor management system, any of those types of things, there's a chance. There's always a chance that, that somebody will come in and, and their system won't work with this process, but you will have an ability at least to investigate connecting those two systems in a lot more simplistic manner than you would if you were to be writing code or something like that. Um, this is Sage Intact Forms and Operational Workflows. So this is extending workflows and form creation inside of Sage Intact. You want to get customer data, you can create a form and you can have that customer populate or that prospect populate that form and it will directly write that data into the Sage Intact application. There is a Sage Intact Professional Services Automation or PSA tool that is coming very soon. You will hear information about this at Transform if you're in attendance there. Um, if, you're, if you're in a professional services market, that could be something that is very intriguing uh, to you. Contracts, a lot of enhancements on the contract side, some basic ones like new cancel and uncancel permissions to give you that more granular control over the contract lines. And then some additional things within the contract behavior with CSV templates and with flat fixed amount frequencies, uh, one-time billing templates, things like that. Sage Intact construction. This is one of the hot topic areas within Sage Intact. Uh, there are great strides being made in, in taking a lot of construction and real estate functionality and rolling that into the Intact solution uh, to provide a cloud-based construction management system. Uh, and they are adding a lot of features uh, to that. There's a, a long list here of, of different things that are there more than happy to sit down individually with our with our construction real estate clients that we do have and and talk with you about what these things are but again this is kind of a a, a non-core module or it is a non-core module so i'll give you a list here in this particular case and if you want more information reach out to us we're happy to talk with you about it uh, and kind of go through no charge and, and see if these Features and functions will be beneficial for your organization and how you can take advantage of them. Same thing here with the Sage and Tack Construction payroll, right? So we, we've got that payroll in there as well. There's field operations. Uh, there is the Sage and Tack real estate. There are a number of uh, modules and features and functions in that area that we can discuss. Now, circling back to something that's going to be available for everyone and beneficial for everyone. Uh, lots of new and enhanced help for existing features. They've taken great care with this, this latest release to update a lot of things, to add videos into it, and to, to make the overall usage of the Intact help training and tutorials even more uh, strong, more pleasing, more capable than it is today, or was last week, I should say. Uh, here's some additional videos. If you're having trouble uh, importing your budgets, here's videos now specifically around importing and how to troubleshoot importing your budgets. Uh, here's one for 1099s. If anybody does 1099s, I'm sure most folks do. Um, and there's even areas in here about adding your own custom help into the system, which I not sure if everybody knows that you can do that, but you can add your own custom help into the Sage Intact solution. Uh, avoiding payments in AP, they've got some new uh, videos, new features out there for that. Importing general ledger journal entries, uh, some uh, examples of templates, uh, and then kind of really cleaning and centralizing those help videos. Again, you can add your own custom help into the system and there is now a tutorial for how you can add or how to add your own custom help into the system a lot of organizations didn't know that you could but you absolutely can add your own custom help to say this is uh these are, are the custom fields we created these are the values we expect this is how 
uh, Acme Corp uh, puts together the list of AP bills to pay with the filtering and all those different kinds of things. This is how Acme Corp runs financial reports, designs financial reports, et cetera. So you can put in your own custom help in the system. Platform services, uh, if you have any use for that, there's some tutorials in there. At least accounting, there's some tutorials in there. And if you are using Sage Intact Planning, there are tutorials in there as well. Now, this next one, I also want to take just a moment and point out to you, they are rolling out, and when I say they, I do mean Sage, they are rolling out the purchasing aspect of um, AP automation to early adopters. So this is getting into the promise that we've had for a little bit now about being able to do those three-way matches and utilize AP bill automation and the ingestion of those AP bills as part of that three-way match process. Don't have a whole lot of information about it right now. Probably we'll see a good bit on it at Transform um, if you're going there. But again, if you're not, look out for our presentations and we'll make sure that we keep you up to date with what's going on. Again, early adopter programs uh, happen quite often. Um, if you want to get into that early adopter program for the three-way match portion and the purchasing portion of this, please let us know. We'll be happy to request that you be added to that early adopter feature. If you want it, just send an email to ERP support at ddaftech.com asking for that to be the case and someone will assist you. All right. I'm going to pause right here. Uh, Nikki, do we have any questions for anything that we've gone over? Yes, we do have a question about the Sage Intact data flow. Do we have any information about if it will use the standard uh, Intact API specifically for better compatibility with user defined dimensions? Uh, we don't have anything like that in writing as of yet, no, but I quite frankly would be shocked if they don't make it compatible or based upon the Sage Intact API. Uh, again, if you think about it, um, it it's going to be one of those kinds of systems where you're able to design your workflows and really that workflow to push data or pull data from Sage Intact really should use the Intact API. So I, I can't say that we have anything like that right now that would that would say that for sure. But if it doesn't, uh, it'd be a little bit disappointing, uh, quite frankly. So uh, I am I am thinking chances are good that it would uh, give you that ability. OK. All right, well, I know we don't have a whole lot of time left, but I do really quickly. I'm going to stop sharing my presentation here um, and I am going to share my computer screen. Because I am logged into the intact application. I'm on the vendors screen now and there's not a whole lot of time to go through a bunch of features, but I did want to come in here. Here is the, the link area where you would turn on the lists beta interface. And if you haven't tried this yet, I would encourage you to try it. Um, you are welcome to give feedback uh, to us. Uh, you're welcome to give feedback to Sage. There is a link right here to send us feedback. Uh, if you don't mind, if you if you have that kind of feedback you want to send them, we'd also love to know it as well too. But uh, for example, now I am in the vendors beta list view and I can still see my uh, columns in here. I still see my view. I still see my data. I still can manage my view and I can create my own views uh, inside the system, edit those views. I still have filtering capabilities. I can do perhaps a lot more with those filtering capabilities in here now arguably on that definitely but it is a cleaner interface and again probably the thing that i like the most is uh, i am going straight into here uh, pretty much no matter what i click on in this screen um, it is a uh, much cleaner 
way to look at the vendors and it is uh, a cleaner way to look at all the different views and it definitely can be less uh, confusing. So take a look at these. Um, you've got your drop downs here. You don't have to remember necessarily what the different statuses are and so forth uh, for this. Um, you can configure these different columns uh, using the gears here. And you've got some additional choices over here for what you might want to see. So if I do want to see the ledger for this one that has $120 total due balance, I can absolutely pull up that AP ledger for Boston properties. So I personally think that this makes it a better experience inside of Intact. I like these beta list interfaces. They are in more places throughout the system now than they were last week. So take a look at them. Um, let us know what you think. Let Sage know what you think. They do listen to feedback. So this is not a black hole that you're putting your information into. They absolutely do listen. And that is what drives a lot of the changes and a lot of the new features and functions in the system. Okay. Uh, so with that the case, uh, if nobody has any other questions, I can honestly say it's been a pleasure to be in front of you today. I hope that this has been something that's been beneficial to you. Uh, certainly, if you have any questions about anything I've said and you didn't get a chance to put them into the chat, please let us know. You can email me directly if you'd like, pmassey at ddaftech.com, or you can send an email to erpsupport at ddaftech.com, and we'll, we'll get you taken care of. Thank you very much.